Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought we would honor the men and women who have served in our United States military with an interesting story from a book called Soldier Girls. It's the battles of three women at home and at war. It's a wonderful story which talks about the lives of three military women over the course of 12 years. More American women had served in Iraq and Afghanistan than in any other role, yet their role in the military has still been hotly debated. We're going to find out how these three women of Indiana National Guard related to each other, not always easily, what their, well, other lives were, and whom their you know, well, you'll find out. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is our guest, Helen Thorpe. Helen, thank you for joining us here on the program today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, what compelled you to spend 12 years with these specific women here in the story, Soldier Girls? So I met these three women in 2010 after they had returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. And we actually spent four years together reconstructing um, the the preceding uh, decade. So while we worked on the book for a long time, I didn't follow them in real time, and I was not okay. with them in Iraq and Afghanistan. But amazingly, they were able to you know share diaries they had kept and letters, emails they had written, photographs, newsletters, uh, just a wealth of material. So I think the book is full of of detail and. Um, the, the reader probably does almost feel like they're along. Well, actually, I did read the book some months back. We were yeah. having you scheduled for Memorial Day, and I was like, yeah. okay, well, here it is again, so I need to put up some refreshers here. Yeah. But what was fascinating was that of the three, one of them really wanted to be in the military and wanted to serve, whereas the other two were trying to find ways out of pretty much, it seemed like, almost impoverished situations. Exactly. And I also was really drawn to the fact that these three women are very, very close friends and yet are so different from each other in their outlooks. So the youngest woman, Michelle Fisher, um, she was 18 when she enlisted in March 2001. 9-11 was about to happen, but she had no idea, of course, that that was coming when she signed up. And she had voted for Ralph Nader. Um, the preceding fall in the 2000 presidential election. And that gives you a sense of her political outlook. Um, she describes herself as a left-leaning, pot-smoking hippie. And um, when 9-11 did happen, she was in training um, at the time, and she instantly understood that everything was going to be different. She had really signed up for the college tuition benefits. As you were saying, it was the military to her looked like a, a way out of her circumstances, mm -hmm. which were hard. Um, but when 9-11 happened and um, the war in Afghanistan began, and then later the war in Iraq, she opposed both of those conflicts. She didn't think those uh, should have happened. She, she didn't agree with the Bush administration at all. Um, and one of the really interesting things that happens is when she deploys to Afghanistan, you know, she becomes very close friends with these two other women who don't share her point of view. So she's sharing a tent with Desma Brooks, who's a single mom with three children, a little bit older than Michelle. And Desma voted for Bush in that election in, back in 2000. And, uh, you know, has, has a really different outlook. And um, Desma also uh, is not a college kid like Michelle. She had dropped out of high school at 16. And... Um, they might never have been friends, uh, except for the fact that they shared a tent for a year in Afghanistan. And um, that experience just drew them so close together that they really became like family. And the third woman um, that they served with, who became very much like family with both of them as well, um, her name is Debbie Helton, and she was 30 years older than Michelle. So when they were in Afghanistan, at that point, Michelle was 21, and Debbie was 52. Uh, she was the oldest serving, she was, she was the oldest woman, the longest serving female soldier in their National Guard unit. And she had fought and argued to go on the deployment. Um, the leaders of their unit had thought maybe they would let Debbie stay behind, that maybe she was uh, of an age where she might not want to do a deployment. And Debbie actually viewed the deployment as 
potentially the highlight of her life. Um, she felt that way because she was working as a beautician, and um, her dad had been in the military. He, he had been a drill sergeant in the Army, and she thought she wanted to follow in his footsteps and that she would find the work she could do with the military more meaningful even than her, her regular job. Um, so yes, as you're mentioning, really a big range of opinion and outlook. Well, that's the interesting thing, too, about the military is that even if it's the National Guard, is it brings together so many lifestyles and, and, and people and personalities that you're going to have those kinds of debates, especially for something that was as unpopular as the war in Iraq and, of course, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Yeah, the war in Iraq being even more unpopular, especially as, mm -hmm. I mean, both conflicts became unpopular as they went on and on and we had lengthy multiple deployments. But at the beginning, the Afghanistan conflict was one that the majority of Americans fervently believed in, really thought was a good idea, and Michelle was sort of an outlier in her opposition. Uh, Desma shared Michelle's skepticism about the war in Iraq. She, Desma just supported the idea of troops being sent to Afghanistan as a response to 9-11, but she didn't follow the logic of why we needed to go to Iraq, and she was skeptical about the wisdom of fighting two conflicts at the same time. So um, whereas, as Debbie felt, both wars were justified, and she came to that conclusion because her hero, Colin Powell, was arguing for getting into Iraq, and she really believed that he was a leader that one could look up to and admire, and so he convinced her that you know, she should support both both wars. Um, but yeah, over time, they, they, the conflicts did become really unpopular as they just went on and on. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. what's fascinating, too, is uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, one of the women, which was Debbie Hilton, uh, she was actually quite a marksman who gained a lot of respect from her male peers as yeah. a result of being able to have such a skill. That's right. Um, Debbie grew up... Uh, really shooting guns all the time. She, you know, starting in high school, she expressed a desire to her dad um, to learn how to shoot, and he sent her to a uh, class um, so that she could learn gun safety um, and, you know, handle a weapon appropriately. And from that moment on, she spent most of her free time um, shooting with a bunch of guys at her high school who also liked to go um, down to a quarry and, like, shoot jugs at plastic jugs that they would drop into the water and they would sort of perforate them until they disappeared from, from view. And this was like their favorite pastime. And then later when she joined the guard, um, Debbie shocked all the men uh, in her guard unit because she shot a perfect score at the range. And they just didn't see that very often. Um, there weren't many of them that could do it. And they never expected it from one of their female colleagues. So she caught caught everybody off guard. She had joined uh, back in the 1980s when there were very few women in, in that guard unit. W women had just been allowed to start joining the unit, and she kind of helped integrate women into the National Guard at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the challenges, of course, was for the single mother of three who had to go, and she was away from the home for a, a couple of years, and so here were these children bouncing around from relatives and ex-boyfriends and, and the like, you know, and, and you start to see how troubling and how hard it can be for a woman to serve in the military, especially when a war is going on, when right. you have a situation like that. Yeah, and um, it, it is really fascinating to understand how, um, how big the changes in military culture have been over recent decades. So... Um, in the recent conflicts, as you mentioned, we had more women serving than ever before. We also had more parents serving than ever before, and that's because these are the two um, longest conflicts that have taken place uh, in, in recent history, and we've had during these two conflicts an all-volunteer military with no draft. So in the all-volunteer military model, um, as it turns out, 40% of the people who choose to sign up are parents. And some portion of them in the reserve component among women, it's 16% are single parents. 
So so 16% of the women in the reserve component are single parents. Uh, so DESMA is not unique in this. Um, the military does not go recruit single parents and say it'd be a great idea if we sent single parents to war. Mm -hmm. uh, but people do get divorced. And so when um, Desma entered basic training, she was married. Uh, she went on to have two more children. She already had one child from a previous relationship. So she had a total of three children, and then she had a di got divorced uh, when her marriage fell apart. And then uh, that's when her deployment orders came. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is just not an uncommon story today. Um, so there were a large number of single parents who served, and it's incredibly disruptive for any parent um, to figure out uh, how their children will be cared for when they're gone for a year. Mm -hmm. You know, what's fascinating, too, is that you hear so much about uh, women in the military and, of course, the proclivities that go on, and sometimes, in many cases, uh, the claim of force, you know, potential rape, that sort of a thing. You know, and it makes you realize that it isn't just a world they can go into because there's, you know, this has been a male-dominated area for centuries and that, you know, women, for the most part, from a man's perspective, should be protected and be at home raising children. But you have these women that have decided to serve and to be part of this culture, you know, and, and so you realize that it's beyond just facing a potential enemy should that arise, which in this case, that's a real possibility, but that the enemy is actually your own, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't make it easy. Your own colleagues sometimes, yeah. Um, the, the women that I wrote about um, experienced different types of unwanted attention during their two deployments, um, and it varied a lot depending on their age. So Debbie, as the oldest of the three women, really was not harassed uh, mm -hmm. at, in anything like um, the way that say, Michelle um, was. So, so Debbie at 52 was not uh, experiencing exactly the same situation that Michelle was at 21. Um, Michelle was sort of hounded uh, by guys from the moment she left her tent in the morning until she got back there at night every day for the entire year that she spent in Afghanistan. And it, the, you know, the ratio of men to women was very extreme on the military post uh, where she was stationed. And um, the ratio was two to one within her support battalion because it was a mixed gender battalion. But they were, mm -hmm. ser they were serving alongside all male um, regiments as well. And so you know, there were just many more men than women on the post. And she was serving alongside um, NATO allies. And uh, you know, the worst harassment she experienced came from Romanian soldiers as uh, as it happened. Um, so it, sometimes it was American colleagues, but sometimes it was uh, for, foreign colleagues who actually were, were even more extreme in some of the things they would say. Mm -hmm. um, none of the three women that I wrote about were assaulted while they were overseas, although those assaults were taking place on military posts across the two theaters, and they were very aware of it. And when Desma was sent to Iraq, and she was... Um, transferred into a previously all-male unit, she was told by her superior officers, carry a knife wherever you go. It is not safe for you on this military post. Do not go to the bathroom. Do not go to the shower unarmed. You might need to defend yourself. Um, that's the kind of atmosphere they were working in. Now, what's interesting, too, is when we take a look at the relationships, uh, they actually, two of the women, if I remember right, had relationships back home. So uh, all three of the women um, went to Afghanistan leaving behind a relationship at home. Okay. And two of the women went on to form new relationships while, while they were deployed uh, in Afghanistan with colleagues. And then one woman, Debbie Deckard, uh, did not do that. She remained um, faithful to her partner at home. Um, so... Michelle, um, for example, had a boyfriend at home that she was intending to remain faithful to, but the deployment was so stressful and she found it so hard and she was so lonely and isolated and frightened, she, and the attention from men was, was so constant. 
she ended up forming a, a new relationship during the deployment with a fellow soldier. And in essence, by forming that relationship, it signaled to all the other men that she was no longer available. And it really helped uh, keep other men at, at bay. Um, and then she went home on leave and told her boyfriend what had happened and uh, was honest with him and, and broke up with him and it explained what had been going on, which was a very painful experience for her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with Debbie, the experience was really different because um, she ended up getting so much support from her partner at home that when she went back home, she actually proposed that they get married. She proposed to him because he had been so supportive of her during, during the deployment. Uh, it, it, so whereas the deployment, the, the, the lengthy multiple deployments, I mean year-long deployments, were extremely hard on relationships. And you saw relationships and marriages break up as a result with a very high rate. Um, in Michelle's case, she lived through that experience of having the deployment cause the end of the relationship she had at home. But in Debbie's case, you actually had the opposite happen, where surprisingly the deployment wound up strengthening the relationship that she was in. Now I'm trying to remember, because there was a really funny part in the book, uh, whether it was Desma or Michelle who brought in, well, female sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that funny when there was a point where they were racing them or something like that. <laughs> uh, Desma is an amazing. Yeah, that, there was one of them that just had this crazy sense of humor. She it's really Desma. just pushed. Yeah, like I said, I, I remember reading. I was like, that was the one that for me stood out the most yeah. because you were thinking, how did she get away with some of the things she got away with? You know, because the military can at times be so black and white and so rigid. But boy, this was a girl that just pushed the envelope, and it was yeah. just funny. <laughs> uh, Desma is really funny, and she does do some outrageous things, and I thought her sense of humor added a lot to the story because a, a story about war and deployments can be hard, and to have somebody with this outrageous sense of humor can really, um, you know, add, add, add to, to, to the story a dimension that makes it much more palatable, I, I think. So Desna does several outrageous things. One, before they deploy, um, when they're getting ready to, to mobilize for the Afghanistan deployment. Uh, and she's stuck in supply, which she resents because she's actually a logistics person and she's meant to be doing slightly different work. Um, she's also mad about having to leave her three kids and parcel them off into different homes. And she acts out, uh, she starts ordering things that she's not meant to, to be ordering that nobody has asked her to, to order um, since she's a su supply clerk. And uh, she orders like, she tries to order, she, not successfully, but she tries to order 10 kegs of beer, for example. Hmm. She does successfully order a whole bunch of like hamburgers and hot dogs. She announces to her colleagues they're throwing a party, totally unauthorized. And she also tries to order a Clydesdale horse for the party. And um, this is really funny to everybody in supply because, of course, they know that the federal uh, government has a database with serial numbers for everything, including even a Clydesdale horse. And so they're like having fun at the government's expense with these like outrageous pranks and, and their commander stops it and you know, the horse never materializes and that money is never actually spent. But Desna is, you know, getting in trouble and doing these outrageous things, which is part of the reason why she and Michelle become friends, even though their politics are so different. Because Michelle as a kind of al almost anti war uh you know, person, uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say activist, but I don't think she's really exactly an activist during the deployment, although she is when she comes back home. Um, you know, M Michelle doesn't have that many people in the guard that she identifies mm -hmm. with, but she does identify with this, you know, funny woman who's doing these outrageous things. Uh, there's something anti-authoritarian or rebellious about it that appeals to, to Michelle. Um, uh, and, and then when they get to Afghanistan, Desma orders 50 pink flamingos off the Internet, plastic <laughs> pink flamingos, and puts them in the sandbags around their tent. So their tent is the, the crazy one with all the pink flamingos around it. And then, yes, she, 
she orders vibrators at Christmas <laughs> and them out to the women in the tent. And some of the women are really actually outraged at being given this gift by Desma. But um, that's that's the the sort of outrageous thing that that Desma did that that some of her friends like Michelle found so funny that it, it actually helped Michelle get through the deployment. Mm-hmm. Well, for those who pick up this book, they'll definitely realize that you really put a profound level of detail to the point where you really feel like you're living side by side with these women, and it was a fa- you know they're all fascinating stories, and you realize, you know, especially from the two that really had to do this out of economic necessity, mm-hmm. you know, that this is what's really kind of happened, uh, you know, here in America is that we've gotten to a point that it really gets difficult to find ourselves, you know, trying to achieve dreams through the common linear paths, for instance, going to college and finding that career, to, you know, and being in an area like Indiana, for instance, and just really having a tough time about, you know, what do we do with our lives and where do we go next? And the military always seems to be the only option. Yeah. A lot of, you see at the beginning of the book how other members in their families have struggled in various factories where various family members are employed or closing and you're just watching the jobs go away. Uh, and they, they, they are very motivated by that economic necessity. Um, and the military does offer them a chance um, to to get college tuition benefits that they couldn't um, access any other way uh, that they were able to, to figure out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for, for Debbie, of course, the motivations are different. And I think Debbie is the one um, out of the th- Three that very very clearly would have signed up after 9/11, um, even knowing that conflicts were likely and deployments were likely, Debbie would have enlisted in a heartbeat. Um, for for Desma with her three children and for Michelle with her political beliefs being being at odds with um, the Bush administration and the decisions to go to war, they they probably would not have enlisted after 9-11. At least Michelle for sure would not have. Uh, and I think Desma um, had, had, you know, I think she would, Desma probably would have been torn about whether to enlist or not. Um, she, I think in addition to um, the economic necessities and, and Desma needing that extra paycheck, Desma is also motivated by wanting to prove herself. Um, because she had dropped out of high school, um, I think the military gave her, you know, she went on and got her GED, but um, she was looking for another arena where she could prove her worth, and the military did offer her that. She takes great pride. You know, Desma has this amazing ability with technical devices, and um, she's sort of a whiz with these very complicated radios that the military has uh, where, you know, it's hard sometimes for people to figure out how to work them because the encryption on them is... Um, very sophisticated, and, and you know, Desma is the one who figures out how to make the radios work, trains other people in her battalion in how to operate them properly. She gets a commendation for this, um, and the, the, the write-up in her military record, you know, that her commander is really singing her praises. Um, so the military offers her this opportunity to uh, be a technical whiz and get praise from the commander, and it's very satisfying for Desma um, joining the military. She thrives in the disciplined environment. Uh, but having kids, it, you know, the struggle that any working mother or any working parent um, experiences, that, that struggle between wanting to be good at your job but then also wanting to be a great parent at the same time and there never seeming to be enough hours in the day, I think that struggle plays out in Desma's life in kind of an epic fashion with her trying to juggle being a single mom with three children who's also asked to do two year-long deployments to foreign countries. She's always trying to balance her commitments. (laughs) I really enjoyed, like I said, the story is something that people should read just because it really gives you an in and out of what's really going on there, especially from the lives of these three wonderful women here. The book is Soldier Girls, our guest joining us here, Helen Thorpe. Helen, is there a website people can find out more? Absolutely. Um, so uh, both there's a website, and the URL is helenthorpe.com, no punctuation, H-E-L-E-N-T-H-O-R-P-E 
com. And I also have an author page on Facebook where I try to post information about upcoming events as well. I'm going to be in Florida for the Miami Book Fair. Uh, I think it's November 21st through 23rd. I think I'm speaking on the 23rd, for example. And I put up information like that, uh, both places. Well, Helen, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. You bet. And that website one more time? HelenThorpe.com. HelenThorpe.com. The book is Soldier Girls. Helen, again, thank you so much for being on the program today. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You know, get a copy of this. Find out what's going on in there. I think you'll really be surprised at how enjoyable and interesting this, this story of these three women are. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at Beyond50Radio.com to find out more. Subscribe and update to our exclusive e-newsletter. Thank you again for joining us. Remember, have a nice day.